fun to be here. Um, it really is. Uh, and thank you so much to the organizers for putting together this event. I'm so glad it's happening. Um, so I will be quick. Um, and uh, a, a little rundown, I guess, of, of what I'll talk about. Um, as you can see, I, I think I'm the first person to really talk about James Schuyler, um, so that's exciting. Um, but mostly I'll be talking about the poet um, Stéphane Bouquet, uh, a contemporary French poet um, who's reading tonight um, and who I have translated into English. Um, so from some of you, I think, are probably very familiar with, with Stéphane and his work, but I think some of you are probably not familiar. Also, I'll give you some context about his work a, uh, as a poet and as a, a translator, in particular as a translator of some of the poets in the New York School. Um, and I hope uh, to demonstrate again um, very briefly, um, but I hope to, to demonstrate um, the way some of the energies of some of the poets of the New York School come, have come through Bouquet to resonate in French and then I suppose um, in English uh, again through his, through his work. Um, so the, the title here is a little bit misleading because I'm not just going to be thinking about the legacy of the New York School, but I also want to think about the way translation actually carries certain energies forward into the future and changes them along the way. Uh, the late uh, Cuban-American queer theorist Jose Esteban Munoz, who came up um, in Rona's talk, defines what he calls queer futurity as the work of not settling for the present, of asking and looking beyond the here and now. Uh, so with the New York School and Stéphane Bouquet as a, as, a, as a pair of grounding examples, I'm going to suggest how, or I'm going to give an example of how poetry and translation can do this kind of work of queer futurity, of, of change and, and uh, transformation and looking forward. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with Stéphane, um, Stéphane Bouquet was born in 1968 in Paris to a French mother and an American father. Um, in, he, he actually made a documentary about um, going to look for his father in the United States and in terms of like the weird personal connections that come up in archives, but also in translator, um, translated poet um, uh, uh, react, uh, interactions. Um, his father turned out to be living in Northeast Tennessee, very close to where I grew up, and so like, Stefan like, flew into the airport in this little tiny airport in Tennessee where I was a high school student at the time. Um, so his range is wide. He studied economics at the university. He's worked as a film, uh, a literature and film journalist at various um, major French publications. He's a screenwriter, a, a, a well-known one. He's written books on the filmmakers Pier Paolo Pasolini, Gus Van Zandt, Sergei Eisenstein, and Clint Eastwood. He's a dancer. He's a choreographer. He's worked at the Centre National de la Danse in Paris. Uh, and there would be a lot to say, and at some point I hope to say it, about the influence of all these forms of media on Bouquet's work, um, on the plasticity of language, the integration of characters and voices, and even theatrical poems. There's a, um, there's a poet's play in a, in a forthcoming uh, translation of, of Stefan's uh, work into English. Um, but I'll just, I guess, note that such a capacious sense of cultural production is a first affinity between Bouquet and certain U.S. poets in the 1950s, the 1960s, there's Frank O'Hara as, as a curator, Ashbery as an art journalist, um, even if not quite the New York School, but I'm also thinking of the Black Mountain School and the co-presence of dance and poetry. Bouquet is the author of, I think, nine collections of poetry, most of them have been Paris by Jean Vallon. And um, the, the, the poem that I'll talk about today is from the book Les Amours Suivants, or The Next Loves, which was published in two, 2013 in French, 2019 in English. Um, and then Bouquet is also the translator of books by Peter Gizzi, Robert Creeley, Paul Blackburn, and James Schuyler, um, and Leanne Brown. Um, and it's this literary input that's probably of, of most interest now. Um, so I'm about to make a, like an inexcusably giant generalization about um, French poetry and also about U.S. poetry. Um, so uh, don't forget me, it's inexcusable. But um, uh, it seemed to me the first time I heard Stefan's uh, work that, um, that he strikes a, like a kind of a note or a tone or a pose that's very different than much of contemporary French poetry. Um, it's actually closer um, than it, closer um, that to the to the kind of chatty, thingy, daily, bodily register of O'Hara, Ashbery, Blackburn, Schuyler, other poets of the New York School. So it's not this is not the only strain of influence that runs throughout Bouquet's poetry. Um, there's the, the kind of like high sadness of Rilke, older than and even Wallace Stevens. Um, but I do think it's a baseline for for his work, and it's also what caught my ear as a translator. 
Um, elsewhere, I've described the process of translating Bouquet's work um, as involving this like, guilty sensation of, the putting, of putting the poems back into English, um, as if they'd kind of been there before. Um, so I do hope you'll be, um, you'll be present at the reading tonight. Bouquet will be there reading his translations. You'll be able to get a sense, um, I'll, I'll, I think I'll read one of his poems in my translation from a forthcoming book. Um, so I'm going to focus on just one tiny moment of influence in translation that I think um, illustrates what I mean by talking about um, translation as, as an instance or, instance or instantiation of a queer futurity. Um, and, and again, like, this, um, in the absence of more work by Bouquet, um, this is sort of a like, take my word for it talk. Um, and in fact, there's a, there's a better example, um, a better and much uh, more complicated example of this kind of influence that happens um, in, in a sonnet sequence in, in, the, in the book that actually um, sends us to the internet of a where where, the, where we like look at a, a at a young poet named Adam Fitzgerald reading um, Ashbery's soon as mended and then we and then like the poem integrates the comment section and so when I translated that I was translating back into English the comment section of a of a comments on YouTube that had already been translated into French anyways um, too convoluted to talk about right now um, so so my example is um, a section of a poem um, by James Schuyler, The Photograph, which is actually discussed um, at, at, at a little bit of length by Munoz in his book, Cruising Utopia. Um, so this is what I have on the screen. Um, this section goes, do I believe in the perfectibility of man? Strangely enough, I've known unhappiness enough, I do, I mean it. I really do believe future generations can live without the intervals of anxious fear we know between our belts and strolls of ecstasy. The struck ball finds the pocket. You smile some years back in London. I have known ecstasy and calm, haven't you too? Let's try to understand my handsome friend who wears his nose awry. This is the end of the poem. It's a hopeful and loving ending. Um, but it's hopeful and loving in its imagination of the future, not necessarily in its vision of the present. As Munoz writes of the poem, the poem imagines another collective belonging, an enclave in the future where readers will not be beset by feelings of nervousness and fear. These feelings are the effective results of being outside of straight time. He writes from a depressive position, but reaches beyond the effective force field of the present into um, this queer futurity. Um, so I, I asked Stefan last night if he has translated this particular poem in French. He does not. He doesn't know it. Um, but I do think that his, his longer poems especially, um, there are several of them in the next love, owe a lot to Schuyler. Um, there's something about the frankness of the lines of inquiry um, and their heady headlong, uh, there's Leanne, Leanne's word, their headlong rush down the page that is reminiscent um, of O'Hara's work, but, um, but also of Schuyler's. Um, so here... Uh, but is the it's just the opening of um, of one of these poems. It's called Light of the Fig, um, and there's a link. Um, the, the the whole poem is available um, on the World Literature Today website. Um, I'll just read the the very opening of a of a long poem. Light of the Fig. I imagine the crocuses also sometimes come down unexpectedly feverish, spreading their long green leaves through the wrong season. So it's October 7th. We're living in Indian summer. Hot and a little empty, maybe, but at least we're living. Lots of people laugh in the street. The primary examples of existence include someone says hi like he wanted to sleep with you, but knows simply and sadly that he won't. Or it's your own wild translation from the wet fringes of his voice to a word less and less likely, hope. Nevertheless, we're alive. Tyler Clementi, Seth Walsh, Asher Brown, and Billy Lucas are dead. 18, 13, 13, 15. The only way to escape their enemies. You, you were luckier in the end. And then the poem goes on um, in this vein. It's a part uh, giant collective uh, elegy to the boys named here, um, and more of them, all of whom committed suicide around the year 2010 as a result of homophobic bullying. It's also part love poem. Um, as in Schuyler's poem, time here is out of joint. There's a kind of um, counting forward through days, even as the poem looks back um, and recounts ages, uh, ages where life's, life's ended. Um, there's also a sense of being in the wrong season at the beginning of the poem. Um, desire is present in this poem, but encounter is foreclosed. 
Yet the refrain here um, and throughout the poem, again, is one of survival and luck and living despite. I think the mention of translation is, is really significant too. Hope um, is less and less likely, but it still exists, and it's the product of, of what Bouquet calls a wild translation. So I, I could talk at, at great length about this um, long poem. Um, but I think that the, the, maybe the most important thing to say is that time is still going forward in this poem, and time goes forward in translation too. Translation helps poems live on, um, but more than that, um, at least in this particular case, because I don't want to generalize about all translation, um, in, in this particular case, translation materializes one more step of whatever progress is possible. Bouquet's work represents an earlier poetics of social, erotic, and political awareness. The New York schools, and here I'm especially thinking of Rona's talk, um, and some of, the, some of the deep sadness that runs throughout this actually very joyful poetry, um, Stefan Bouquet's work um, takes, takes some of that awareness and reflect, refracts it through a different sensibility and expanded global consciousness. Um, so another, another kind of um, uh, step, iterative step forward is that Bouquet's tra poems travel in their locations and references not only locally but also globally um, in a way that, that the New York School poets work mostly does not. In reaching back toward these earlier life, uh, writers of gay life, um, of daily life and gay desire, Bouquet translates, so to speak, their work into his own, reckoning with the sadness of globalized difference and inequality and grieving or worrying over the past, even as he anticipates and celebrates new possibilities for relation and collectivity. What poetry and translation do together, again, in this particular case of Bouquet and the New York School, is help open up a future, a queer futurity in which what came before can now be heard differently. Mm -hmm.